So let's begin uh, with an overview of security. So when we talk about security, uh, forget about uh, cellular 3G or 4G, 5G. In general, if you talk about information security, two main things come to mind, right? One is that uh, we should prevent others from seeing the data. So suppose I sender is sending some data to the receiver. A middleman should not be able to get hold of the data and uh, inspect the data and read that data, right? So that kind of uh, protection of data is done by something called ciphering, also known as encryption. So what it does, the original message which is transmitted by the sender, it could be a text file or a PDF or an email or voice communication, that is speech or audio, doesn't matter what kind of content we are talking about. In the terminology of cryptography, it is called as a plain text. So what ciphering or encryption does is to convert this plain text into what is known as cy cipher text. So anybody, any kind of hacker who intercepts this data, for him it will look like garbage. It, the data will look like uh, as if it's random and he will not be able to derive the plain text, that is the original message from the cipher text. So this is the fundamental principle of ciphering. That is, given the cipher text, we should not be able to go back to the plain text without certain uh, uh, secrets. So only the receiver who has access to these secrets can derive the original plain text from the cipher text. So this is the first thing, ciphering. Then the second thing is integrity of the message. Suppose the sender sends a message to the receiver and there is a hacker in between. So the hacker can obviously come, if he has the right tools, he can go and modify the message. See, he may not be able to read the message because of ciphering, because the message has been ciphered. But that doesn't prevent the hacker from modifying the message, putting in some garbage. So it can be like a denial of service or it can be uh, injecting certain message to suit his own malicious purposes. So a hacker can modify the message and the sender can be convinced that this is a genuine message. Uh, sorry, the receiver can be convinced that this is a genuine message coming from the sender. And the receiver decodes and processes that message. And uh, in the course of time, the hacker has met his objective. He may be able to communicate uh, with the receiver, although the receiver is thinking, you know, he's talking to the original sender. So integrity has these, uh, you know, I mean, anybody trying to hack, uh, you know, in this manner, this can be prevented using integrity protection of the message. Basically what integrity protection does, given the content of the message, the sender will compute something known as the message authentication code, which is a fixed uh, length. Typically it may be 32 bits, or in more complex cases, 64 bits, 128 bits. So a message authentication code is ca calculated from the contents of the message, which is being transmitted by the sender. And this MAC is transmitted along with the message to the receiver. So what the receiver know, uh, does after receiving the message, uh, the receiver also has access to certain secrets, just like the sender. And it also knows how to compute the MAC. That means the algorithm for computing the MAC is well known. It is published in the uh, 5G standards. So the receiver will also compute the MAC from the message. And then the receiver will compare the computed MAC with the MAC received in the message. If these two are different, then the message has failed integrity protection. That means this validation fails and receiver will assume that the message has been tampered by a third party and the message will be rejected. If the computed MAC matches the received MAC, then the receiver is confident that uh, no one has tampered the message. Message has been received in the form that was originally sent by the sender. So everything is good. The message will be accepted. So these are the two basic kinds of uh, algorithms that 5G has defined. Ciphering algorithms to protect the uh, content of the message integrity to ensure that the message has not been tampered. Okay, so these are the two things uh, that we talk about. Apart from uh, so apart from this, there is something uh, called authentication. 
see this is only about messages algorithms pertaining to messages but before these things can be invoked on any kind of data uh, transmitted between a mobile and a network the mobile has to be authenticated maybe the mobile wants to also authenticate the network so that is also there so authentication by itself is a big procedure so we are not going to look at authentication in detail in today's session that could be a talk of a future session but authentication uh, is also very important and it's very much tied to uh, ciphering and integrity why i am mentioning authentication is that authentication also involves some algorithms okay but we are not going to uh, you know uh, delve uh, to, uh, too much into the depth of those algorithms which uh, are part of the authentication but one thing which uh, it it makes sense to uh, discuss or uh, mention at this point is the uh, authentication which is based on sim so uh, most of you are, are aware most of the mobiles they have a sim subscriber identity module or something like that that's the full form and this sim or sim card is the actual identity uh, of the uh, the subscriber and this is inserted into the mobile equipment now this sim contains something known as a secret key or shared key you can call it and the same key is there in the network okay so that is one of the most important uh, aspects of security same key is available both in the network as well as inside the sim and that shared key is the one that is used i mean it's not directly used but from that uh, base key many other keys are derived both in the network as well as in the mobile and those derived keys become inputs to ciphering algorithms and integrity algorithms so later on in the talk i will briefly uh, cover a little more detail about the keys but we just have to keep in mind that a lot of authentication is based on sim traditionally uh, you know traditionally means 3g and 4g uh, sim based authentication was the main form of authentication but in 5g there are other forms of authentication because let's talk about iot devices there will be like uh, hundreds and thousands or maybe millions of iot devices out there which are connecting to the 5g network now iot devices are supposed to be very uh, cheap small form factor uh, taking up very less power so it will not be possible to put a sim in every iot device but they too have to be authenticated so to cater for these kind of use cases uh, 5g has introduced other forms of authentication which are non sim based right so this as i mentioned is a, again a, a big big topic so we'll cover it in a different uh, session okay so that's about uh, ciphering and integrity now the question will be uh, where is this applicable so for this uh, to make sense of this we need to look at a representation of the 5g network so let's uh, look at a representation of the 5g network this is a very uh, yeah this is not the best diagram but we'll use it for this purpose so as you can see here there are uh there are many uh, details here but we'll uh, club all of these boxes into one called the core network so this all these boxes are part of core network and beyond whereas these two boxes here on the left one is the ue ue stands for user equipment or your smartphone then uh, ran stands for radio access network so what uh, you know the lay person calls as tower you know the my uh, mobile is connecting to a tower this is something you hear frequently so when we say tower is uh, in uh, technical lingo we call it uh, base station and specific to 5g we call it g node b right so the uh, g uh, base station is referred to as a g node b in 5g so ue connects through the wireless interface to the base station so this aspect of uh, you know the connection is called uh, access network radio access network and the security established between the uv and the radio access network that is called access stratum security context so you will often find the phrase as security context as stands for access uh, stratum then uh, there is a context which is between the uv and the core network 
right? UE also sends some messages to the core network. So this aspect of security is called, or this context is called NAS, non-access stratum. And the security context in NAS is called uh, NAS security context. So there are two aspects to security. One is the access stratum. That means messages between UE and RAN have to be secured. Then non-access, that is NAS security context. That is messages between the UE and the core network have to be secured. So that is the NAS security context. So going back to our, uh, you know, original uh, article here. So when we talk about, uh, you know, 5G security, this happens in two contexts, both in the access stratum as well as in the non-access stratum. Right, so this is very important. Now, uh, let's have a discussion here. Some of you, many of you have talked about, uh, I mean, I've heard about WhatsApp, no? Some time back, maybe a couple of years back, WhatsApp said, uh, you know, we are going to implement end-to-end -end security. That means all your messages will be encrypted end-to-end. -end. Now, the question is, uh, is 5G security end-to-end? First of all, what is end-to-end -end security? Anyone cares to explain? When WhatsApp says, you know, they are doing end-to-end -end security, what do they actually mean? And the follow-up question is, is 5G guaranteeing end-to-end -end security? Yeah, end-to-end -end security means basically from sender to receiver, the whole uh, path, the whole channel okay. is uh, secured. Okay, then uh, what is the implication of that? Why, why did WhatsApp uh, advertise it so much that we are now, uh, you know, implementing end-to-end -end security? What is the advantage for the user? Yeah, that means like when you send a message to someone else, like uh, whatever path it takes, wherever, whichever service it goes through, etc. doesn't matter, but it, it, the, the whole process, it's encrypted. So nobody can access it and uh, decrypt yeah, it yeah. in the middle. Yeah, thanks for that response. Yes, you are right. So. That's what WhatsApp uh, claimed, but of course, in reality, nobody has inspected WhatsApp code, source code, right? And how data is handled within the uh, meta network. So they say something uh, that is their claim, but a third party or independent organization has not had the chance to go and uh, validate that. So we have to simply believe WhatsApp is saying, but given the history of meta and Facebook, you know, the trust among the users is very low for, for WhatsApp and Facebook and Instagram. So they may say they are doing end to end, but it's really questionable. Are they really doing end to end? So that, uh, yeah, that's just my comment. Now the question is, so, uh, I mean, uh, generally end to end security is good. That is what users desire. That means they don't want a third party to have access to their data. Right. So suppose I am uh, looking at my email from Gmail server. Gmail is somewhere. I am downloading that email to my uh, uh, smartphone and it is going through the 5G network. I don't want anyone in between to have access to my email. So generally, if I am using uh, my network, uh, let's say my network is uh, Vodafone or some of you may be using Reliance Geo. We don't want these guys to have access to what data I am transferring. I, I hope all of you understand, right? So yes, Geo is uh, my uh, service provider, but do I tr trust Geo? That's the first question. Do I want Geo to have access to my data? That is to say, I am downloading certain emails from Gmail server. Do I, do I want Gmail to have access to that data? Obviously not. So for this to happen, there should be end-to-end -end security. Everyone agrees? Yes. So th that's the first thing, right? Now the thing is, question for you, does 5G guarantee end-to-end -end security? That's the first question. Anyone wants to comment from what you might have read in the media or if you are in telecom, you may be knowing. Does 5G give end-to-end -end security? Yes, it does actually. Okay. Uh, did you read about that somewhere or someone told no. you it gives no. end to end security? Like, uh, 
uh, like uh, any data is coming from the data network, like uh, it will be completely be secured, up, apply the encryption algorithm from the NAS side, as well as when I go for over there, we are applying the AI security. So the UV uh, and their IP data, whatever we received, it is encrypted actually. So we doesn't know what exactly the IP packet is already having the security or not. But whatever as IP packet, I received it. I am doing encryption from the corner of side or the UPF side. And I need to ensure that until it reaches to the IP, the packet to the mobile, it will be secured by secure based. OK, so thanks for that uh, input. Actually, uh, 5G does not guarantee end to end security. What uh, this person Usala has said is the what we desire. See, this is exactly what we may be thinking. 5G is such a I mean, we expect it has evolved over many years and it probably is, uh, you know, designed to have high security. But unfortunately, it doesn't give end to end security. And this goes back to how it is implemented in the network, access stratum and non access stratum. To understand this a little bit, let's look at the protocol uh, stack of uh, protocol stack of. I'll bring up the protocol stack diagram, so this will give us an idea. Uh, let's say new radio I type. Okay, 5G new radio. So here there should be a yes. So this is the protocol stack of uh, 5G. On the left side you have the user plane, and on the right side you have the control plane. So we said there are two types of uh, security context. One is the access stratum, and one is the non-access stratum. So the access stratum uh, security it is applicable both for uh, I mean both are applicable user plane and control plane. Uh, so you have here access stratum. The security context is in the UE and the G node B. That is the base station. And in which layer it happens? Security happens in the PDCP layer. So you see the protocol stack is de defined in layers. It's a layered architecture. And each layer has a defined uh, set of functions. So ciphering and integrity protection are features or uh, functions of PDCP layer. So they are executed in the mobile in the PDCP layer and in the base station that is G node B in the PDCP layer. OK, that's the first thing. What about non access stratum? For non access stratum uh, security context, again in the UE it is executed in, in, in NAS layer. And in the network it is executed in the AMF uh, network function. OK, so there, there, there is a counterpart for the non access stratum. So this is where it is executed. So all this is fine. Uh, now let's come back to our user plane data. Let's say I'm uh, downloading Gmail from the Gmail server. Right now that is a user plane data and we can see here clearly that the access stratum security terminates at the G node B. That means between the G node B and the uh, core network and the external data networks by default 5G doesn't put any security in place. So now security is a role of it is something that operators have to take care through other means. So what are the other means? So typically what operators will do, they will use something like IPsec or TLS to secure communications over the 5G uh, core network. So we are talking about let's say N3 interface and N6 interface. N6 interface is the interface that connects. I think we have the diagram here. Just now I brought up the diagram. I don't know, this is uh, always have problem with teams. This toolbar is preventing me in accessing the tab. Okay, so forget it. Uh, see the N3 interface is the interface. Okay, here we have another one. N3 interface is the interface between the G node B and the UF, UPF. Then we, between UPF and the external data network, we have the N6 interface. But our access stratum security context terminates at the G node B. And over the N3 and N6 interface, potentially the data could be unprotected from ciphering and integrity, right? At least from the 5G perspective. Now, 
if the operator is smart, they will protect this data as well through something like IPsec or uh, TLS or some other mechanism. And uh, there is a second aspect to it. Uh, even if, let's say, the data is not uh, protected using IPsec or TLS, Gmail itself uses HTTPS, so we should not forget that. So that means at the uh, application layer, uh, Gmail uses HTTPS. That means under that, TLS is being used to protect the data from the application layer. So from the application side, data is protected, but through the 5G network, data is potentially not protected over certain interfaces. And this comment applies also to, let's say, N1 interface, N2 interface, N4 interface, because these are all external interfaces which go into the 5G core. Then the second aspect is communication among the network functions, which you see here, they are all service-based architecture. So for service-based architecture, we know as a fact that they all use HTTPS and uh, 5G has defined TLS version 1.3 for uh, as the protocol suite for service based architecture. So to give you an example, this protocol supports five cipher suites. One of them is like something like this AES 128GCM SHA-256. So to break it down, AES 128 bit in GCM mode that is used for ciphering and SHA-256 is used for integrity protection. So that means to conclude, Within the service-based architecture, this is what you find. So HTTPS is used, which is built on top of TLS uh, 1.3 version, and that has its uh, set of uh, ciphering and integrity uh, protection algorithms. Right, But that is not defined directly by the 5G standardization. That has come as, a, uh, as an input from uh, probably IETF, which defines, you know, which has probably defined a TLS as the sec protocol security suite. Okay, so now I am not actively working in the telecom uh, industry today, but I have friends who are actively working in the industry, and they tell me that you know, uh, to my surprise, they tell me that most of the uh, uh, what you call within the 5G core network. Such, such as the service-based communications or even uh, this core network connecting to uh, external entities through these interfaces, they are actually not protected, which comes to me as a surprise because uh, mainly for performance reasons, uh, I have been told that uh, in real deployments, people are not, uh, operators are not protecting their uh, internal communications uh, using HTTPS or TLS. So what is it? Why, why is the case? Because they see this as internal or private to their organization. That means it, these interfaces are typically not exposed to the outside world. And even let's say N4 interface, SMF is under the control of the operator. UPF is under the control of the operator. So the N4 interface is also under their control. It is not exposed to the outside world. Right, so they take the call that let's not protect this because this is anyway part of our internal private network. But uh, in my personal view, that is a big flaw in the implementation or in the, the way it is being deployed because a hacker is always smarter than uh, you know uh, uh, the other side of the equation. So hackers will find some sort of a flaw. So it is always better, better to protect your data through encryption and uh, integrity protection. That is uh, my own opinion on this. So we'll come to like this. There are many other uh, problems in uh, 5G when it comes to security, which I will uh, talk about briefly towards the end of the talk. Any questions at this point? So what we have covered so far, we looked at uh, the definition of what uh, what is ciphering, what is integrity protection, and subsequently uh, we understood what is access stratum security context, what is non-access stratum security context. We looked briefly at uh, the importance of authentication and keys. Now we we'll look at uh, what are the different uh, algorithms which 5G has defined for ciphering and integrity protection.
So before I move on, any questions? Yeah, I think I have one query. Um, Go ahead, yeah. And thanks, Harvin. So actually, um, as he said, actually, uh, any support or any security on NTR N6, right? Uh, it all basically it will be wired connection, right? So that is the main point that internet interviewer or cannot be accessed the physical interface, right? Basically, so the reason they introduce the circuit encryption decryption or uh, encryption ciphering over there, basically they don't nobody cannot be decode the signals. So where from there they can try to get the algorithm use algorithm try to get the key, but in the case of core network, it's all been uh, wired based, right? Uh, so maybe that's the reason they are not considering the security and the processing of uh, all the data which is coming from data network, it's very difficult to be do the processing of all the security encryption decryption, right? It can delay the data. Yeah, so uh, this is what I heard for performance reasons. But you see today's world, security is paramount. So I don't uh, agree with their assessment. Okay. So just for performance, we cannot uh, send uh, data in plain text within the network. Mm -hmm. Even though you say there is no wireless involved, it is wired. But a smart hacker can always find a way to hack it. So yeah. that is my comment on this point. Yeah. Makes sense. Right. And let's assume I am an employee of Geo. What prevents me from hacking the system? Right. So that can be prevented if, for example, if it is protected because Within uh, Geo, as uh, I mean, I'm giving Geo as an example. Within the operator network, there are, you know, thousands of employees. If even one of them goes rogue, it can be a problem. So we have to be uh, operators have to be proactive, and they have to encrypt the data. The most of these whistleblowers. How do these whistleblowers uh, come about? No, we have heard of so many whistleblowers, right? And uh, they typically they are somebody who has worked who are working in the organization, and they find that there are certain things which are unethical. Then they blow the whistle. It can also be an employee who is not happy with his employer, so he can try to do something. So we have to consider all these third factors when we are operating a network that is as important as a telecom network. Okay, any other questions before I move on? Okay, I'll move on to the next bit. So which are the ciphering algorithms? So in 5G, we have uh, three ciphering algorithms and uh, they have given code names and identifiers for all of them. There is one more fourth one, which is identified as NEA0. So NEA stands for N, N for NR, that is new radio, which is the 5G way of referring to things. E for encryption, A for algorithm. And the similar names have been used in 4G and 3G. So this refers to null ciphering. That means in certain cases where let's say the UE is connecting to the network for the very first time, then it is impossible to uh, in, uh, you know, start ciphering or integrity protection. So in those cases, you have to start with null uh, ciphering as the way to communicate to the network. So it has its uses, but of course, uh, it has its uh, limitations, right? It pr doesn't provide any security. The really uh, the uh, important ones are these three algorithms, which is uh, identified as one, two, and three. And if you delve into the details, this one is the Snow 3G based uh, 3G. Uh, the name of the algorithm is 128-bit Snow 3G. It's a word-oriented stream cipher. Then we have the famous AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, which was, I think, first standardized in probably in the 25 years ago. Uh, and now it is widely used uh, everywhere. So this 128 AES based algorithm, it has multiple modes. Uh, so it is basically a block cipher, but when it is used in CTR mode, that is counter mode, this transforms itself to a stream cipher, which is what we want. So uh, 
And the beauty of this algorithm is it can be pipelined, parallelized, a key stream can be pre computed. Right? These properties are there uh, for this particular algorithm. Then we have, uh, yeah, the third one, which is the Zook uh, algorithm. So this is also a stream cipher, uh, and all of them are 128 bit uh, based uh, algorithms. Now, in the future version of 5G, uh, maybe in 5G advanced, uh, they may enhance these algorithms towards 256 bits. Right? Already proposals have been made and uh, people have evaluated those improvements. So that's the uh, and uh, those 256 bit variations may also make it to 6G. So what we see is evolution. In fact, these algorithms are not new to 5G. All of these have been already there for 4G. So uh, very little has changed in the uh, in these algorithms. So more or less they are same as what was used in 4G. So from a uh, algorithm perspective, uh, nothing has changed between 4G and 5G. So that's about the encryption uh, algorithms, uh, ciphering algorithms. And similarly, we have three algorithms for integrity protection, and they are also based on the same algorithms. Snow 3G. AES based, but now this is not in counter mode because we don't want a key stream. What we really want now is a uh, message authentication code because as I said, the purpose of integrity uh, protection is to generate a MAC, fixed length MAC. So AES in this case is used in a different mode called CMAC, so which gives you a fixed length uh, message authentication code. And the third one is again the same uh, Zook based algorithm. Now, both these algorithms, uh, three here, three there, they are used in two contexts, both the contexts, non access stratum as well as in the access stratum. Now, an important observation here is that when it is in the access, non access stratum context, the key, main key used for uh, ciphering as well as for uh, yeah, integrity protection, so they are. So basically, uh, the keys are different for uh, AS context and NAS context. So in AS context, we have this KNAS encryption, and then likewise for integrity protection, KNAS int, right, integrity protection. And for access stratum, there are two keys. One is for RRC encryption and user plane encryption. So one is for the control plane, one is for the user plane. Likewise, here, access stratum, we have this one. For integrity protection, we have RRC int, and then for the user plane, uh, we have uh, you know UP int. So this is uh, what we have. And when we use these things, use these algorithms, they have to be initialized in a certain way. So for that, uh, we should have an understanding how these algorithms will be used in a wider context. So you see here there is this block which represents the algorithms that we have discussed. This can be either null or zero, one or two. Uh, sorry, one, two or three. Likewise for integrity, it can be zero, one, two or three. But you see there are many inputs that go into uh, the execution of these algorithms. So what we see here is that uh, you have a count, bearer, direction, length. Then the important thing is the key. So we already discussed how, how the uh, various keys which are used in uh, as inputs to these algorithms. But all these keys that we discussed, they are all derived from the original key. The original key, as I said, is coming from inside the SIM. Likewise, in the network, the network has a copy of that uh, key, which is also there in the sim. So from that key, the other keys are derived. And these keys become input to the algorithms. Apart from that, there are other things which are initialized properly according to the context. So we have these things, count, message, uh, direction. So there is one bit for uh, zero, I think means uplink, uh, one means downlink, bearer, so, yeah, so this can be either a NAS identifier in the case of a NAS context, or it can be a radio by, by based on the radio bearer identity. 
for the access stratum context. Count, this is something that increments. So typically every message, let's say we are talking about AS context. AS, as I mentioned earlier, it happens at the PDCP layer. So PDCP has a, uh, a counter called the sequence number. So every PDCP packet has the sequence number which increments. So that sequence number is the uh, base on which this count is based. Likewise, for the non-access stratum security context, every NAS message has an identifier. So that becomes the basis for initializing this uh, count value. Right, so the standard has defined exactly how each of these variables have to be initialized and they become inputs to executing the algorithms. And this I have given here, you know, the details uh, like key is 128 bits, count is 32 bits, bearer is 5 bits, direction is 1 bit, and MAC is 32 bits. So this is the overall structure of how ciphering and integrity protection happens in 5G. And it is not very different from how it was done in 4G or even 3G. Many details are the same. OK, so this is uh, what we have. And uh, one of the things uh, about the integrity protection is it protects against replay protection. That is to say, you cannot send two messages with the same count value. Count has to increment for every uh, message. So if you know the receiver finds that the same count value is used, like uh, it shall reject the message. Whether it's a non-access stratum context or access stratum context doesn't matter. So there is a replay protection, uh, which is part of the integrity protection. Now let's go into the now this is uh, the next part is slightly mathematical, but of course we are not we are uh, I'm sure most of us uh, are not from the background of cryptology or cryptography. But it will uh, so we will not go into the details of uh, these algorithms, but it makes uh, some sense to be aware how these algorithms are designed. What are the elements of these algorithms? So the, uh, there are three algorithms that we discuss broadly. One is the Snow 3G, AES, and then finally Zook. And if you look at this, uh, one of the things uh, that you will find in two of the algorithms is this uh, shift register. So you have a 16 stage shift register. That means with every clock, this goes here, this goes here, and so on. Right, so this shift register and there is some feedback. So the technical term for this is linear feedback shift register. And each stage, so there are 16 stages, each stage has 32 bits. So each, each stage contains a 32 bit word. And uh, this kind of a, a topology or a structure is present in two algorithms. One is the Snow 3G as well as in Zook. So both these algorithms have this linear feedback shift register. Now, before using this algorithm uh, in this manner for generating the key stream, what we need to do is to initialize this shift register and also probably initialize the registers here. So uh, that is you know, defined in the standard how to initialize these two before using it for generating the key stream. So that is the first thing. Then the second thing is uh, this called something called FSM, finite state machine. So you can see here the state is captured in three registers in this algorithm. And in this algorithm, it is captured in two registers, R1 and R2. So this holds a state uh, of the FSM. So here they call it FSM. Here they call it for some reason nonlinear uh, function F. But basically, this is also a finite state machine because the state is captured in R1 and R2. And with every uh, iteration, the state is updated. OK, so this is also uh, like an FSM. So, so in Snow 3G, these are the two basic components. Linear feedback shift register and then the FSM. Then here, same thing, feedback register and FSM. 
But in this case, you will notice one difference. These two are connected through another stage called the bit reorganization, BR. So what it does, it takes certain words from the feedback shift, uh, shift, uh, shift register and feeds them into the next stage, which is the FSM. But then it also takes two uh, 32 bit words and uh, feeds them into, uh, sorry, it's two uh, 16 bit. Uh, it takes parts of two stages and feeds them towards the key string. So that is also something it does uh, as part of the bit reorganization. So the whole point of doing all these transformations is to uh, something called diffusion. It is a concept in crypto cryptography. Uh, so the idea is if you change, uh, you know, certain bits in the output or in the input, it should affect many bits in the output. So, uh, so to bring that kind of randomness, all these bit transformations are being done. So uh, this comes to the design of how uh, crypto. Uh, uh, cryptographic algorithm. Then coming to AES, which you see on the left side, AES a little bit different. It takes the plain text and then it generates the cipher text through many uh, stages, round one, round two, round three, and so on, up to 10 rounds. So the way this works is slightly different. So plain text is transformed to cipher text through many stages. And uh, to, uh, so through many rounds and within each round, it does substitution of bytes, shifting the rows, mixing the columns, and then uh, a uh, final stage called the add the round key. So the key is involved only in this stage where you call uh, where the where you call it uh, add round key. In other stages, the key is not used. Okay. And in these cases, key is used uh, even from the beginning. So yeah, this is uh, broadly how these two, uh, these three algorithms are structured internally. Uh, yeah, uh, as an implementer, suppose you are tasked with implementing these algorithms either in software or in hardware, we have to be aware of uh, you know the structure of these algorithms. But we don't need to understand the rationale behind the why it has been designed like that, or why these two stages are connected to the next stage. Why not uh, S13 and S12? So we don't have to get to that level of detail. But of course, if you are interested in cryptography, yes, you can read about it. A lot of details are there, uh, are available online to understand these things. So this is the internal structure of uh, these algorithms. Any questions at this point? So typically AES is uh, stronger, right? As our stream ciphers uh, don't have the kind of security that AES gives. So any idea? Yeah, like all of them are actually pretty good. Uh, okay. Or if you are uh, yeah. Or if I have to take uh, the pessimistic view, all of them are equally bad. In the sense, a hacker has similar challenge for attacking all three of them. Okay. Right. So and uh, but one thing I will uh, agree with you: AES is so well known that it is used everywhere. I'm sure Wi-Fi also uses it, and even our wireline communication will use it. So take yeah. for example, this is Devopedia website, right? We are uh, looking at this page from Devopedia website. Let us inspect this page. And you will find here. Okay. So you will find here a tab called security. And if you scroll down, you can see here this connection to the site is encrypted and authenticated using TLS 1.3. And as part of TLS 1.3, X25519 is used as the HMAC, that is message authentication code, integrity protection. Then for secure uh, ciphering, it uses AES256 in GCM mode, which is uh, AES256 bit ciphering. So it is very secure. So AES, the reason I'm showing you this as an example is AES so, so prevalent, it is not only used in uh, 
4G, it is used in 5G, it is used in Wi-Fi, it is used in uh, wireline communication that is on the internet. So it is widely used everywhere. So probably one of the very well-known uh, security algorithms. Whereas the other algorithms you may, may not have heard like Zook or uh, Snow 3G, but they are also uh, used or widely used in uh, 5G and 4G networks. Right? Okay, yeah. thank you. So, any other questions? Yeah, is there any specific uh, algorithm we are using in a 5G, like uh, apart from AES, or mostly uh, all the operators are completely relying on AES? Yeah, anyone knows the answer? Any te telecom engineers in this group? So you see, uh, the first obvious answer is that they cannot use anything they want. They have to use only one of these three because only these three are standardized. Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, to say so the choice is limited to Snow 3G, AES, and Zook. They can't yes. use anything else. Now coming to your, uh, so the real uh, reply to your question is in the next part of my uh, talk, which is, you see some mobiles, maybe low end mobiles, okay? So they may not support all three encryption standards. They may support, let's assume for argument's sake, it supports only Snow 3G, right? So there is a mobile uh, manufactured by somebody and that mobile supports only Snow 3G. Maybe it's a low end mobile. So the developers or the mobile manufacturer decided I'm going to support only one encryption. I'm not going to support all three. I will support only Snow 3G. So what will happen is the mobile, when it initiates a connection with the network, it will dis uh, disclose what is known as UE security capabilities. So it will tell the network, I can support only this Snow 3G. Then immediately the network is limited. Network has no choice. It has to, and if the network, that is to say AMF and uh, G Node B also supports uh, Snow 3G, then no issues, right? Typically network will support all three. So then what is the overlap? The overlap is only through Snow 3G. So that mobile, uh, the selection is done actually by network. Mobile doesn't do any selection. Mobile will only say, this is my capability. And if it is capable of only Snow 3G, then the network has uh, uh, no choice. So Snow 3G will be used as the uh, algorithm for both encryption and integrity protection. But now let's come to uh, another uh, scenario where the mobile says, I support Snow 3G and AES. So it gives the uh, operator or the network two options now. Now the uh, network has to take a decision. So this is where operator uh, con configuration comes into picture. So operator can say, I want AES to have higher priority. So I, so he will configure in his network, AES higher priority, Snow 3G lower priority. And let's assume for argument's sake, uh, Zook is also supported and Zook is the uh, priority in between these two. Let's uh, assume. So now since the mobile supports these two and AES has higher priority, network will select AES for that mobile. So you see there are uh, three things which are considered. Algorithm supported by the network, algorithm supported by the UE and the priorities of these algorithms. Given this set of information, the network will decide what algorithm to use. The decision is not with the UE. Okay, so that is what is explained in the next question here. So here I have explained how you know the algorithms are decided, right? So based on these things. But what is the actual handshaking between the network and the mobile? So like I said, there are two contexts, NAS context as well as the access stratum context. So in the case of NAS, there is something called NAS security mode procedure, where the AMF will send something called NAS security mode command message to the UE. UE will reply by saying NAS security mode complete. So just now we talked about uh, network selecting 
a particular algorithm. So that selection is done by AMF based on uh, whatever we discussed. And that selection is now indicated to the UE in this message. So in this message, the uh, network will indicate, OK, now I want you to use AES because that is what I have selected for you. So once UE gets this message, by the way, this message is integrity protected. Once UE gets this message, it will process the message provided the integrity protection is valid. And then as soon as it is valid, it will send the reply. It says NAS security mode complete. Now, interesting thing with this message is this message is all because now it's got all the information to start the NAS security context. So the reply coming from the UE is both integrity protected and deciphered. So AMF will receive both a message which is protected in both aspects, integrity as well as ciphering. So it will first check the integrity of the message. If it passes, it will check the, it will decipher the message and the unciphered message, plain text, it will process. Right. So this is the handshaking between AMF and UE for NAS security mode procedure. Similar thing happens for access stratum security mode. The difference is here, AMF is not involved, but rather it is the base station. Either it's a G node B or NG E node B. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, we'll just for practical purpose for today, we'll just say base station. So similar procedure. But here the only thing I want to add is that uh, AMF is configured with the set of algorithms which uh, you know the network is supposed to support. So AMF informs G node B because AMF is connected to G node B via the we talked about that interface N1 interface N1 N2 interface. So uh, so through that interface, you know, uh, AMF informs G node B. These are the algorithms which are supported by the network. So according to that, G node B will select the algorithm for the UE for the access stratum security context. The rest of the procedure is very similar to what we discussed here. OK, so this is the initial handshaking which happens between the UE and the network component entities. When. Uh, when uh, th these procedures happen and these procedures uh, happen not only in the initial connection stages, but uh, at other stages also, let's say there is a handover. Right, the UE is handed over from one G node B to another G node B, or for that matter, from one AMF to another handover, AMF. And there are two uh, multiple uh, types of handovers: N2 handover, you have XN handover. So in the, those cases also, the target G node B or the target AMF will also give inputs. These are the algorithms that I support, and those inputs are related to the source AMF or source G node B. And uh, that information is conveyed to the UE through the handover command or whatever appropriate command command for that uh, handover. OK, so those kind of signaling is also important so that handovers happen smoothly because see in the case of inter AMF handover, there is no guarantee that the target AMF will support the same set of algorithms as the source AMF. There is no guarantee. So. Uh, so transferring the security context during handover is also very important. OK, so uh, that, that's uh, what I wanted to convey here. The rest of it is, uh, yeah, you can also read this article here, how uh, these things are done. Uh, there is one more thing which is uh, applying integrity protection and ciphering. We talked about, uh, you know, how it is done through the handshaking, but that is for signaling. What about the user plane? Because user plane traffic happens a little later, right? After signaling has gone through, user plane traffic starts. So the ciphering and integrity happens uh, is enabled slightly different, differently for the user plane, where SMF is involved in here. So SMF informs the base station, G node B, something called the user plane security policy, and it does this on a per PDU session. So there could be a case where some PDU sessions are not important, so the 
UPF will say, okay, uh, SMF will say, you don't need to protect this session. Right? So, G not B also will convey that to the UE. So, some sessions need not be protected. Whereas, uh, other sessions, you may have to, you know, most likely most sessions are protected, but standard has given a provision that an M, the call is with the SMF. SMF gets to decide to set the user plane uh, security policy on a per PDU session basis. Okay, so these are the broad uh, things I wanted to discuss. And uh, there are other things. Uh, there is one more thing which I want to discuss, which is uh, SUPI and SUKI relationship. So some of you may know uh, the these are important identities which uh, identify the mobile. The main identity is SUPI, and that is uh, subscriber or subscription or permanent identity or identifier. So the standard says that SUPI should not be transmitted in clear text over the air interface. That means uh, the only option left is you have to encrypt it in some way. So the encrypted version of SUPI is SUKI. Subscriber or subscription concealed identity. Now you may ask what is the, uh, how is the encryption done? So this encryption is done using uh, an asymmetric uh, encryption algorithm, which I have briefly uh, shown here in this uh, diagram. So here you have SUPI, which is uh, subscription permanent identifier. It has MCC, MNC, and MSIN. MSIN is uh, just one part of the MC, which most of us are familiar MC. So this is uh, what we call SUPI. But because this can't be transmitted on the air interface on clear text, this is encrypted using this asymmetric algorithm. And you get SUKI. And uh, yeah, the receiver of SUKI can, uh, of course, uh, derive the, from SUKI, they can derive the SUPI. Yeah, they do the same thing, asymmetric uh, decryption they do, and uh, the SUKI can be obtained. So this is how it is uh, done. Uh, I'll not go into the details of what kind of algorithm they are using. Now the another part is the key generation. We talked about key. So earlier in the session, I talked about a secret key which is there in the SIM. So this is represented as key, a K. This is also there in the network because the network is the one that hands out SIM cards. From this key, other keys are derived. So to give you an example, uh, from key, uh, from K, two keys are divided, CK and IK, ciphering key, integrity key. And from here, other der derivations happen. So K for the authentication uh, network function, user uh, network function, AUSF. Then uh, ACAF, that is another network function. Then finally, KAMF, which is the important key for non access stratum security context. Right? But this key is not directly used for ciphering and integrity protection. So, again, from this key, you derive the two keys we discussed earlier K for NAS encryption, K for NAS integrity protection. So, these two keys are derived from KAMF which in turn is derived from the secret key in the SIM. Something similar happens for the access stratum security context. So for access stratum security context, you derive from KMF, you derive the KG node B. And then the KG node B is used to derive these four keys. So user plane integrity, user plane encryption, user plane RRC integrity, uh, sorry, uh, RRC integrity, RRC encryption. So these four keys are derived from K, G, node B. So this is the overall uh, uh, key uh, derivation. Uh, I don't know what you call it, flow chart or hierarchy. So and all these are very well defined in the standard, how these derivations have to be done. So all these derivations are done inside the mobile. And similar derivations are done in the network. So they are uh, so uh, 
it is guaranteed that the key that mobile derives for KMF is same thing as what the network derives. Same thing for K G node B and so on. So the keys will be identical. If there is a mismatch, then of course everything will fail. Right, ciphering will not work and the integrity protection will not uh, go through. So it is very important that both sides derive the same keys. OK, so last thing I want to cover is the vulnerabilities. So we discussed a little bit earlier. I talked about how. 5G security is not end to end and uh, to my surprise, operators are also sending things in clear text within the network. Or in those areas, uh, in those interfaces which are non SBA. So which is yeah, which is you can say it's one issue. But researchers or security analysts have identified many other problems, right? In LTE, they have LTE uh, that is in 4G, they have identified vulnerabilities, and the same issues are there in 5G as well because the same algorithms are being used. So one of the exploits is uh, like updates, location updates, okay, MC caching, right? So one of the things uh, which briefly I will mention, if you remember, there is something called null ciphering and null integrity protection, which we uh, saw earlier in the talk. And uh, you know when the mobile connects for, to the network for the very first time, that is a, an issue because there is no uh, common context, agreed security context between the mobile and the network because this is the first time the mobile is connecting to the network. So in that particular case, there is no choice but to use the null algorithms. And that presents a challenge. So some of the exploits are based on the null algorithms and this paper describes them, right? In fact, this paper is titled about the towards 5G security analysis against null security algorithms. Right, so uh, these researchers have analyzed that. How this presents a threat vector for the 5G system. But there are many other ways in which uh, the system can be hacked. So typically hacking uh, has two components. One is either it's a design flaw. That is in the design of the algorithm itself, there is a flaw or it's the implementation flaw. That means design is fine, but the way people have implemented, that is a problem. So look at this table here. So you can see here they have identified a few uh, types of uh, vulnerabilities in the 5G system. Some of them are design flaws. That is to say the way the specification has been designed, there is a flaw. In some other cases, it's an implementation flaw which can be corrected if you put a patch. So who does the implementation? It can either be the equipment vendor, right? Suppose I am Ericsson, I am Nokia, I am Huawei. I could have made a mistake in the implementation. Or I am an operator. I am Reliance Geo or I am, uh, let's say Vodafone. I have done some wrong configuration in my network. Or I am using certain Cisco, Cisco switches which is supposed to be configured in a secure manner, but I did not configure them properly. So you can treat them as implementation flaws or deployment flaws or configuration flaws. So that is also a flaw. So these are the kind of flaws which can happen, uh, you know, in a real uh, 5G system. Design flaws, implementation flaws, configuration flaws, you know, deployment flaws. And, uh, you know, people have identified in these kind of situations, what are the ways in which I can attack the network? Right? Using sec during the security mode procedures, I can attack. During RRC connection reconfiguration, this is used when you are adding a user plane bearer, data radio bearer when you are adding. That is when, you know, encryption and uh, integrity are activated for the user plane uh, traffic. So there people have identified flaws, spoofing attacks, scanning attacks. So this is EPC. That is when you are handing, this, this can have occur during inter 
rat handover. That is to say, when you are handing over between 5G and 4G systems, this kind of a problem can happen. So we'll not go into the details, but there are issues in the 5G system. Uh, so yeah, so this is what I wanted to bring to your notice. Any questions? Uh, that's it for uh, what I wanted to cover. And any questions? Yeah, thanks, Arvind, for a nice overview of the security aspects of 5G. That's very good. Welcome. So one question I have is uh, the algorithms that you have discussed. What is the implication on latency? Because we have ultra low latency scenario also. So yeah. what is the kind of implication? Can we like uh, satisfy latency constraints with these algorithms? No, I uh, frankly, uh, you know, this is. Uh, yeah, there, uh, but you, uh, that is a concern and. Uh, I mean, I don't know uh, what is happening within the industry, but from what I've heard, using performance as a reason, operators are disabling some security uh, practices, good uh, best yes. practices. Like I said, yeah. within the network, they treat it as internal to their system. Right, uh, service-based architecture, AMF, SMF, they are not exposed typically to the outside world. So they say, OK, since it is not exposed, it is internal to my uh, deployment. I will not enable uh, in, uh, you know, TLS on these systems. So that is what, but since you asked this question on uh, performance, first we have to know what is the performance benchmarks. So for this, a lot of study has been done. So, so this is a software implementation of these algorithms on a risk five platform, right? But these are future algorithms, 256 bits. We are only talking about 128 bit algorithms. Now you can implement in hardware, let's say FPGA. So this is a page from Xilinx. And if you look at the Xilinx website, they perf uh, release performance uh, measures. So you can see AES 256 in CBC mode, decryption, encryption. So let's take this as an example. For decrypting AES 256 CBC mode, what is the throughput? 4.7 Gbps it can handle, right? This is a huge number, right? And uh, a mobile is nowhere capable of receive, I mean, uh, it is not designed to receive this level of throughput. Typically, you know, I mean, what is the typical uh, best mobiles? Maybe 500 Mbps they can receive. Or let's give it benefit of doubt, one Gbps downlink it can receive. But if you implement encryption decryption in uh, FPGA, it, it is capable of this kind of throughput. So that, that means what I'm trying to say, chips are there which can handle throughput uh, that, that meets the design parameters of uh, 5G. Same thing if you take uh, you know, this uh, integrity protection, in this case, HMAC, 8 Gbps, good enough. Let's take some more examples, that is performance examples. I'll give probably one more. OK, this is. Uh, OK, just for argument's sake, I'll show you this. What the numbers here. What they have, I don't know if they have published a table. OK, simulation results of algorithms. So you can see here it is uh, 35 Mbps 11. Uh, so the difference is here, this is in risk 5 architecture and uh, presumably uh, it is at a lower clock speed right 400 megahertz clock speed so even at this so here uh, this is a more complex algorithm right 256 bit so here it is going beyond the design uh, specifications of uh, 5g so this algorithm 
at this uh, in risk file with this software implementation it will not be enough so that much we can make out but you see this study has been done without at least if you look at aes right aes has a special support called ni new instruction which speeds up the computation by a factor of i think 8 to 10 faster but this simulation has been done without uh, using aes new instructions but if you in assume that risk 5 you you are allowed to use aes new instructions then you can expect this times 8 or maybe even 10 so this will go up by a, by that that much uh, factor and likewise here so th that is some of the things i want to point out let's see if any other okay this is uh, another one from uh, okay this is snow five paper we already looked at it but uh, this paper here it is not a risk five implementation this uh, hardware design area and speed okay this is uh, you can assume fpga implementation and we are talking about snow five uh, algorithm and it is compared with the AES-256 as well. And here you see the speed in a hardware implementation, the speed is huge. So that means this is more than enough for the design specs of uh, 5G algorithms. So I hope this gives you some idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. They have given a good list of resources. Yeah. So good. this is yeah. why when I look at these things, uh, yeah. I don't agree with the industry assessment that, you know, it will impact performance. Yes, it will impact, but uh, you you have to do, uh, improve yeah. your design. You have That's to bring in uh, resources aspect, correctly. Yeah. When we talk of so it's devices. not technical reason. Uh, I would yeah. say it's more like uh, other reasons, cost reasons. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. See, generally as a developer, we also know we, uh, many developers, we look at security as the final aspect. First, we focus on functionality. We make Correct. sure everything yeah. works functionally and uh, we always think back of our mind security is important, but it is always given uh, second priority. So same thing, I am sure it is happening in the network. Okay, yeah. And why I say that security is important is in the previous generation, uh, core network equipment were all uh, proprietary to telecom, right? Specialized hardware, specialized uh, uh, interfaces, which were used only in telecom uh, domain. So it was obviously a lot harder to hack those systems. Now, most of the core network is now no longer a telecom proprietary or telecom specific. They are a service-based architecture using typical HTTPS, TLS, uh, uh, I mean, typical web technologies. So given that if you are not protecting your data, then uh, you know there is a good chance that uh, you are exposing, making it easier for hackers to hack. Because now functionality can be accessed through an API endpoint. Right, everything is now uh, API based. So it simply makes it easier to uh, hack that is the point is it clear yeah it's clear yeah so mm -hmm. see the whatever threat vectors we used to we are, we are used to in 4g that is no longer the case in 5g the threat vectors are more in 5g because uh, you know the architecture is different anyway that's my opinion yes of course industry has its way of, own way of working and of course they they may have their valid reasons but as an outsider as a user this is what i see yeah i would like it to be more secure if nothing else why should i trust uh, my provider reliance geo or uh, you know vodafone why should I trust trust them? I don't want my data to be available to them, right? So that is that is another point. 
so okay then see, uh, uh, yeah any other questions go ahead see, somebody was asking yeah yeah this is sandeep here uh, i will uh, when yeah. you say it's uh, now the uh, as and date like in 5g it is all uh, on uh, clear text of uh, communication so is it only from the uh, are you talking from a over there perspective like from the access to the core or end to end it is completely uh, clear text yeah see end to end applications have to take care so let's take an example of end to end uh, gmail i am on my mobile i am accessing my email from the gmail server so end to end is between my mobile and the gmail server that is end to end now fortunately gmail always serves your data or your emails over https right so that means https is now uh, taking the responsibility of encrypting your data end to end but let's uh, think of another example application where uh, maybe the guy has not renewed his certificate it has expired so end to end, so the connection is not https it is it is simply http so now in that case what happens from that server to my mobile it is not end to end encrypted so that is plain text because the connection is http now let's break it down let's uh, break it down then uh, let's go back to the diagram here okay so what we see here as dn data network this is where your application server is residing right let's assume some web server and that data is coming through the internet over the and goes to the ue so end to end it is not encrypted because http is being used not https so what does it mean that means it is clear text on n6 n3 and so on but then over this interface that is encrypted on the uh, air when it comes between ue and ran it is encrypted because we have the access stratum security context so here it is encrypted but between ran and upf upf and dn it is not encrypted right or on the n9 interface if it goes from one upf to another there also it is not encrypted because let's assume the operator has not done that but if the operator is smart that is if they take uh, security seriously they enable ipsec on all these interfaces or their own uh, they they deploy tls so even though there is no end to end security between the web server and ue over n3 n6 and n9 the operator has deployed let's say ipsec so the data is protected so anybody snooping at this interface they can't get hold of the data because it is protected with ipsec that is the point i am trying to make right uh, so but uh, 3gpp has uh, defined specifications right scas specifications which is which is under 33117518 and all so yes yes see it says yes, right. use ipsec or something right. equivalent but you see uh, it is like a recommendation finally the authority is with the the choice is with the operator correct, correct right because mostly what 3gpp cares it cares that ue and the network should interoperate so most of the specification are specifying the ue behavior and the network behavior in terms of this interoperation between network and ue so that any ue in the market should be able to talk to any network correct. but within the network they are a little bit uh, flexible some some things they leave it, leave it to the operators so what i heard from uh, some of my friends who are working in telecom even today they say that many operators they don't enable ipsec or tls in these interfaces so that is the point so standard may say these are the things which you can use but operator takes the call right because uh, we were uh, i mean i was part of one of the project where uh, last year where we were uh, working for an o oem or the core OE core uh, oem 
it was developing some network functions. I mean, it has its own network functions. So they wanted to have the uh, SCAS uh, validation on uh, all their network functions. So mostly they in the, they have those features, but only th things are that whenever they implement on the operator side, where I mean the operator whether it wants to enable those features or not, it's something that they decide. Yeah, that's what. Right. Yeah, the, my comment is also on the operator. See, the network yeah. vendor may provide whether it's Ericsson or Huawei or Nokia. They may provide all the functions to implement IPsec or TLS or whatever acronym you are using. But operator may disable it. Yeah, because of right? their, their side. So they may say the because other. of performance reasons, we are disabling it. Also, maybe some interoperability issues because they, they might have uh, got, uh, let's say, uh, vendor A providing some network function, vendor B providing some other other network function. The interoperability, if they enable that, is, is will be a challenge. That could be also a reason. Yeah, there could be various reasons, but um, yeah, point is somehow security is still like treated as second citizen or second priority. Thank you. Functionality becomes first priority. But they maybe you are right. Interoperability that is a valid reason. But they have to have a roadmap. In the next uh, three months or six months, this problem has to be fixed so that we can enable security. Something like that. A any particular major uh, security incidents that you can uh, that you know that which has happened in five G for some kind of major. No, I am not aware. But yes, I am also looking online. Is there anything like that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it will be interesting to know. The thing is, even if it has happened, uh, unless somebody blows the whistle, it is hard to. They won't publicize it. Right. Right. So typically what can happen? Uh, somebody. Uh, Let's say UDM. UDM has the user databases and stuff right. like that. So somebody, th this is the one that people will try to hack. Right. Uh, once they get hold of the keys, then you know they can uh, potentially, yeah, do many uh, things in the network. Yeah. Right. So how will it come to light? Somebody hacks into this gets hold of a database of let's say a million subscribers and then publishes some part of it or it the news comes out that somebody is trying to sell a database of 1 million subscribers right which is something we hear once in a while about other database right, right. somebody right. got hold of other database it is on sale so the equivalent of that in the telecom would be Somebody got hold of got hold of the subscriber database because certain in interfaces were not secured and so on. Right. 